bon appetit to those who are eating. Uh, I'm French, I live in Spain, so it's Spanish time for lunch, which is great. Uh, so enjoy, enjoy your food. And we have a, a hour, hour pack uh, agenda with amazing speakers. We have three short panels. And um, I'm very pleased to welcome on stage um, Hannah Vaughan Jones, a Sky News and CNN presenter, who's a, a broadcaster for today and will moderate the sessions. And um, Chris Bryant, Ambassador of Advocacy at American Kidney Fund. So please come on stage and we're looking forward to your conversation. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies to interrupt your lunch for some of you. Um, it's a real honor to be here. My name's Hannah Vaughan Jones, as Alex just uh, kindly introduced me. Um, and I'm so, so uh, delighted that I can be here and sort of parachute into the global health community, which I've somehow managed to, to find myself in ever since uh, leaving my broadcasting days behind me. We have uh, just one hour to pack quite a lot in, so buckle up, everyone. Um, we are here to talk about chronic kidney disease, CKD, which impacts 850 million people worldwide. We want to elevate CKD as a global health pri priority on the health front because it is expected to become the world's fifth leading cause of mortality by 2040. And on the economic front as well, because workforce absence alone due to CKD could result in a $37 billion loss in tax revenue by 2032, which is quite astonishing to me. So if, if money is your motivator, then the stats speak for themselves, I think. Um, we also want to push CKD up the NCD agenda ahead of what is a pretty major high-level meeting taking place next year. Some of you may have heard of it. And as the title of this uh, session states, um, we are here to emphasize the importance of an integrated approach for cardiovascular, renal, and metabolic conditions. I am so, so thrilled to have Chris here with me. Chris Bryant um, for our initial conversation before we get into the panel. So Chris is an ambassador of advocacy with the American Kidney Fund. He's a New Yorker, that feels important to mention. Um, and Chris, you have type 1 diabetes and you have first-hand experience of diabetic kidney disease. Now, 30 years, I think I'm right in saying living with, with type 1 diabetes, right. that in and of itself would be, you know, a challenge, but it's rarely alone, is it? So like many others, you have experienced the complications that come along the way with very, very siloed care. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I could talk about T1D or type 1 diabetes all day, and I could talk about CKD all day long, but we're limited in time, so let's jump right in. We've got seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, basically, um, any age that you're di diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is a challenge, but it's particularly challenging when you're diagnosed as a teenager, which I was. Um, you're going through social development as well as academically being developed. That also covered because you felt invincible at that time. I'm sure many people out there felt invincible at the teenage years, not thinking about a chronic illness. Well, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 16 years old. And, you know, it comes with a, a huge challenge as, as it is a, a lifestyle change, something that you will have for the remainder of your life. But those uh, anxiety and those depression stages go quickly away and become sadness and scared uh, because you want to avoid from having any of these complications that stem from diabetes. And I wasn't immune to that. Uh, many years later, I was diagnosed with CKD or chronic kidney disease uh, right out the back. It was like a punch in the gut. Um, and I had to challenge that throughout all of these years, even until today, because my journey still continues. But I have a lot of these things floating in my head and saying that, you know, your greatest trials give you the opportunity for your greatest triumphs. I love that. Um, and I know that, you know, you mentioned about that CKD was something that you then experienced later on or realized that you had it later on as well. What difference could an integrated approach to care, so cardiovascular, renal, and metabolic, what difference could that have made to your life, to your quality of life? Well, you know, when you have any of these chronic illnesses, and this type 1 diabetes, coupled with CKD, it just adds to the challenge that comes along with it. And, you know, when I was diagnosed with CKD, it was just, boom, I go to the doctor, and all of a sudden I have, I'm a late-stage kidney disease patient, and I would start dialysis soon after. Uh, you know, when you when you start dialysis, you know, there's different ways to start it. But what I like to call it is I crashed into dialysis. And as I go to this dialysis clinic, I look to the left and look to the right. And I see many folks that fit the same demographics as I do. Um, and it raised more questions than answers. 
And, you know, when I start to learn about um, kidney disease, I thought everybody fell into dialysis the same way. Um, when I learned the truth is that I could have been diagnosed a lot earlier at an earlier stage where I could have been treated uh, or um, at the very least changed my diet in order to put less pressure on my kidney, um, possibly delaying dialysis. Uh, but once I learned the truth, those uh, anxiety and depression left and became more of anger and fear um, where I um, turned that fear into advocacy for other patients and asking other patients to be screened for kidney disease. It's very important to be screened for kidney disease. Let's face it, folks, 10% um, of the population has some stage of kidney disease, and we need to learn if we have these stages so we can be treated, so we can avoid getting on the expensive treatment of dialysis. Um, this is going to be a challenge, and it has forced me the uh, the empathy that I have for other chronic illnesses, and that gives me a chance to advocate for not only uh, health care uh, improvements, but also social support. We, we're so keen to sort of focus on integrated approaches to care as well. Does one condition take priority over over another? So when for, for health care providers and also for patients as well, is there where should the focus be when it looks to managing these interconnected conditions? Well, these interconnected conditions, there should be nothing that's actually higher than the other. They all should be focused on equally across the board. Everybody should have the same access to those uh, those illnesses when you come down with these chronic illnesses. It's important for um, you to be screened early. Um, early intervention is very important. How then do you hope to inspire others through your own advocacy? And you are very inspiring anyway, but I, I wonder what's needed. Is it education? Is it awareness? Is it is it policy change just straight up? Yeah. So, you know, when it comes, this is, this is dear to me in my heart in terms of supporting folks that are dealing with chronic illnesses, in particular CKD. Um, the support group that I have is uh, for diabetes and it's labeled, I have diabetes, diabetes doesn't have me. And, you know, getting support um, from any source, from the medical care team to your family is invaluable in terms of managing the emotional support and the practical assistance. But it's a different dynamic when you can connect with a person that actually is going through what you're going through. Um, I have these support groups where I can connect and perhaps bring some somebody out their shell that may say to their family that they're doing fine, they're doing okay. And it can really turn into some fear or um, more of a frustrating support group, which is fine. We welcome that because we want to come together as a community and let everybody know that uh, what's coming down the path in terms of um, continuing to get the proper care that you need and deserve, as well as lessening the ambiguity that comes along with health. Well, Chris, we're so grateful to you for taking the time out to advocate Thanks. in front of all of us today. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Chris Thanks Bryan, everyone. Me. Thank you. Um, we are now going to move on to our, our first panel discussion. Um, I'm going to have to do something with different microphones for a second. There is a system in place, don't worry. Um, so how do we leverage next year's UN high-level meeting on NCDs for better integrated care so that people like Chris get more effective and appropriate treatment before their conditions turn chronic? I'm delighted to say that I'm joined for this conversation by Melanie Turner, who is the Director of International Science with the American Heart Association. Jose Luis Castro. Jose is uh, the WHO's newly appointed Special Envoy for Chronic Respiratory Diseases. Delighted to have you here, Jose. Dr. Monique Vleda is the Practice Manager for the Global Health, Nutrition and Population Unit at the World Bank. And Katie Dane is the CEO of the NCD Alliance. So welcome to all of you. Uh, please do take a seat. Maybe we can... Yeah. Yeah, we're all, we all have a seat. We're okay. <laughs> Lovely. Melanie, let me start um, with you, if I may. Um, the American Heart Association, I understand, recently coined a, a new syndrome called cardiovascular kidney and metabolic syndrome, otherwise known as CKM. What is it? And what does it tell us about the connection then between these diseases and, and the need for an integrated approach to care? Absolutely. And thank you for the question. And I feel really inspired by what Chris just told us about the disconnectedness he has experienced. Um, so the syndrome has existed. We know it exists, but American Heart Association has really just put um, some structure around that for clinicians to be able to better manage those conditions. Um, and one thing in particular that is new to think about is the 
bidirectionality of all those conditions coming together. So we know that metabolic risks such as obesity and diabetes are going to contribute to kidney disease, which is then going to contribute to heart disease. Uh, but it also works the other way. Um, someone who has existing heart disease can then have complications uh, with metabolic risk and kidney disease. Uh, so this new structure has put together a staging for clinicians to use to properly screen and diagnose these patients at an early stage. So starting at stage zero, where you are fully healthy, you have no risk factors whatsoever, to a stage four, which is your fully developed disease progression to heart disease. Uh, so like Chris was saying, screening early is important. So we know then like, what needs to happen, early screening, as you say, but how do we pay for it? And uh, uh, Monique, I'm coming to you on, on this one. Talk us through sustainable financing, how governments can use it to then to, to cope with the, the burden of chronic diseases. And welcome. Thank you, and um, I'm delighted to be here, and thanks for uh, the invitation. Um, so um, maybe I'll take, before I talk about the financing, take a step back and say at the World Bank, we recently announced um, a new uh, goal to reach 1.5 billion people by 2030 with health services. And, um, and there are three pathways to reach that. Um, one of them, is to expand the package of services that we've been financing uh, to double down on maternal and child care when needed, but really in recognition of that huge burden of NCD disease. And, um, and particularly um, because of uh, the demographic changes and the rapid speed with which countries are aging, we're seeing a very large uh, burden of, of non-communicable disease. Uh, we also want to lower um, the financial barriers for people to access services, which is particularly important for people with, with chronic diseases, um, as, as well as um, to um, uh, increase the geographical coverage of where we intervene in finance. So how will we do that? And it comes to your question on the, on the financing. We will deploy all of our financing tools, right? And so we have funding for the poorest countries in the world that is partly grant or very concessional lending. We have funding for middle income countries and actually a lot of poor people live in middle income countries. And we also work together um, to deploy the uh, private sector financing um, also from our uh, from IOC, our private sector arm of the World Bank, uh, to also invest in the production of diagnostics um, and as well as service delivery that is important to reach our, our goals. So it, it really requires a multi-stakeholder uh, approach um, which uh, allows us then to fully put all of the financing tools of the World Bank uh, behind it. Um, and then maybe say one other thing, we have a fantastic amount of great partners um, in this space. Uh, some of them are, are also here uh, today and uh, it is a massive agenda and we recognize that that really requires uh, a partnership that brings, brings innovation but also brings aligned financing to support governments to make these changes to their health systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jose, I'm going to come to you. You're, you're relatively new in post as a special envoy um, for the WHO, but you know, you've been advocating for change in the NCD space for, for many, many years, I know, um, specifically in chronic diseases as well. So broadly speaking, what's your, what's your vision for a better management of chronic diseases? Sure. Thank you, Hannah, for that question. And, you know, as I listened to, uh, to, to the speakers uh, before me, I think the, the important um, uh, aspect to take into account is that the patient um, comes with uh, comorbidities, comes with more than one disease. We need to think about the human being that is affected by the disease and um, think about the technical packages that are needed you know, to, to, to advance um, uh, that, that agenda. I think that we have more strength if we do that together than if we go individually, you know, with one disease or 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 the other. Um, what is also important is uh, in the advocacy is to educate the public and work with the journalists to communicate the uh, uh, information about the disease so that it is known. And as um, um, uh, it has been said earlier, the the early diagnosis is. is 
crucial always in the uh, and prevention and, and the management of, of, of the disease. And I will also say that the development of community uh, and patient groups is very important. The, the voice of the uh, those who are suffering from the disease, those who are affected by the disease, it's important in educating the public and convincing the policymakers and also in driving change. Yeah. And with that, trying to influence the policymakers, then Katie, I'm going to come to you on this one. As we look ahead to this uh, high level meeting taking place next year, next year's UNGA, what are the specific actions that the global community can take now to, to drive real change for patients right now as we as we look towards that meeting. So obviously we've been hearing about the need for early detection, we've been for education, but is there anything that would be from the NCD Alliance your kind of big call for what can change now? Sure, thank, thanks for the question. I mean I think it's important to highlight that this is the, the fourth UN high level meeting on NCDs and mental health. We've already had three. We've we've learned an awful lot of what works, what doesn't work in getting political traction for the issues. And I think the co context of this next high level meeting is really important because, you know, number one, we're not where we are, where we should be in terms of global progress on NCDs. Only six countries are actually on track to reach the premature mortality target. And most of the other targets are well off track. So, you know, we've got a long way Way to go and we really need to make sure that this high level meeting sets the bar high and creates that sense of urgency. But I think the other thing about this high level meeting, which is the same for all other UN and multilateral processes at the moment, is the geopolitics of the of the current you know day is is challenging. It's going to be hard to get strong political commitments. But I, I would say in terms of the um, the opportunity, you know, 12 months from now we'll be here um, at the high level meeting. The process has already begun, and really the next six months are the most important because by the time you get to next summer, negotiations on the declaration will have started. So we absolutely need to start now. At NCD Alliance, we've got five big priorities for the high-level meeting. Um, number one is about accelerating implementation, making sure that what we know works is implemented on the ground because we've seen a huge implementation deficit over the years. Number two very much links to Monique's point about financing. It's been one of the biggest Achilles heel of response. So trying to make sure that this high-level meeting results in some really strong financing commitments and ideally targets. Number three, trying to make sure that the high level meeting is not just talking about NCDs, but it's linking to other agendas. So the integration side of it, linking to universal health coverage, pandemic preparedness, humanitarian settings, so many important other global health and development agendas that we need to be linking in. Number three, four, I think I'm on, is uh, community engagement, which is very important for CKD, but overall in NCDs, really making sure that we've got lived experience advocates like Chris, um, who we heard from earlier, at every table, at every policy discussion, at every discussion around how we're going to design and deliver our health services and how we monitor and evaluate progress. And then the final one is the other important context of this fourth high level meeting is that it's really the end date of the current WHO global targets that we've all been driving towards and monitoring for the last 12 years. So really trying to ensure that we've got some strong targets that look well beyond 2030 into 2050 and that really set a very clear agenda for, for NCDs going forward. Thank you so much for that. And it, I think the bit that stands out for me the most is the need, is the integrated care approach. And we heard that from Chris as well, the difference that that would have made to his life had he had um, earlier diagnosis and differential diagnosis from an earlier stage. And um, Monique, I want to come to you on the on the financing side of this, because we're looking towards next year and we're looking towards how do we sway policymakers. It all obviously, so much of this comes down to money. How do we leverage investment in primary care then to make sure that people get this kind of differential integrated approach to their conditions? at the primary stage. So in uh, in June um, this year, we hosted as part of the pathway to the to next year's high level meeting, uh, jointly with WHO, the NCD financing forum. Um, and we invited 
Um, I think there were 25 different country delegations um, and just wanted to emphasize that um, I think there is a growing recognition of the importance and centrality, uh, but a lot of questions around not just the financing, but also what are the implementation experiences of countries and where has it worked well and that the NCD financing forum was a fantastic opportunity to raise more awareness and have those uh, conversations, particularly also between countries in terms of how to translate some of of these commitments into realities and implementation and um, there's a, there are some major shifts that need to be made in in the way programs are designed what the service packages will look like uh, but then in addition all of this is happening in very very different difficult uh, fiscal environment for countries and so we have to continue looking at what we can prevent is better than what we need to treat um, uh, the population-based interventions can be hugely um, impactful and tobacco controls, uh, sugar sweet beverages, and are, are relatively um, uh, cheap as compared to treating someone with comor com comorbidity. Um, and there's a lot that can be done across the health system and service delivery to use existing resources better. Uh, for those interventions we know have really proven to be effective. And so uh, under difficult fiscal constraints, there's a lot that we can do uh, collectively. Uh, and that is going to require more financing, but it will also require a much more prioritized and targeted uh, focus on investment in those interventions that are most impactful. Melanie, what does the integrated approach look like in real terms for, for healthcare providers? So when they're having to deal with, with different specialities as well, how, how does that actually kind of manifest in real terms? One of the things we're working on at American Heart Association and have just launched in the past few months is a quality improvement um, initiative that's implemented through our Get With The Guidelines patient registries that are used all over the United States. Um, and that's really a tool for those hospitals to look at the measures that are laid out by our new staging and uh, care guidelines and say, how well are we doing? Where are our care gaps? Um, where can we prioritize to the earlier point and use that to then improve the system. Because, you know, Chris told me, like, before we actually came on the stage, he said in a previous um, chat that we'd had that, you know, he saw multiple doctors at the very early stages, you know, and so, and everyone sort of, it's so siloed, all of the care. So it's exactly. just like, how do, how do we break out of that? and make it not only practical in terms of how the care is delivered and diagnosed, but also that, that policymakers know that this is how we need to invest. We need to invest across the board if we're actually going to make an, a, a difference. And it will save us money. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, how, what's the kind of advocacy that you're doing in that area? To well, we are uh, working with NCD Alliance and also the World Heart Federation to support those policy and advocacy changes, because without that, the programs and tools that we're developing are not sustainable. Um, we need those governments to support that within their systems and within everything from the system to the uh, physician education and then even the community tools that we have. All of it's going to require those changes at the top level to sustain implementation. And Jose, I can just about see you. <laughs> um, what can the cardiovascular renal metabolic um, uh, uh, sector care, what, can, what lessons can they learn from respiratory in terms of implementation of policy, how to actually make it work? I think... Um I'm going to speak about more broad um, respiratory. I've been in this job for three weeks, so it's too early right. probably to... <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot to, three weeks but in. I, but I've been, work, <laughs> I've been working in this area for about 30 years. I've learned a few, a few things. Um, I think the importance of data um, is, is, is crucial in gathering data of what works and what is not working, sharing that information across so that um, providers and policymakers and community groups have information about the um, packages and the effectiveness of those, the application of uh, those packages. Uh, I think the also another part that is um, essential uh, is for the governments to have a national plan or, or um, a plan of action to address this, uh, this disease so that it's clear what the goals are for, for, for the country, what the goals are, uh, and, and what progress is being made towards achieving uh, them. It is very important also to um, develop um, a, um, an active uh, 
um, uh, community in, among the legislators as well, because we need to, uh, as has been said, it's very expensive to treat this, and this is not philanthropy's role. It's not. Um, it, it's something that will require uh, sustained financing, and only go governments can provide that. And finally, I want to stress what you know, Monique said also about. Uh, addressing the root causes that that, um, that lead to these diseases and prevention, and we have many tools available and policies that can be put in place that will go a long way to um, uh, preventing people from getting sick. We know that it costs so much more further down the line as well. So it seems like the, the you know the the evidence is is stark and it's there for all to see. But Monique, how do we convince governments then to actually do something now to avoid you know massive costs later down the line? Yeah, and I, I think when you look at um, uh, the issue of aging and longevity, it, it becomes even more that question becomes even more urgent, right? And so uh, countries are are going through an accelerated demographic shift um, and very rapidly aging and the quality you, you might get older but you're miserable if you're sick with communicable disease right and and so and that is happening so rapidly that it's right in countries faces but still right it still requires quite a lot in terms of what needs to be done now and what we have been advocating for and last week we actually uh, released our, our new report on longevity that is effective very much about NCDs um, and we're, what we're advocating for is to start really really early because you know having children that are, are fed with healthy food and that are not obese and they will become adults and change their behavior and, and look differently at, at how they prevent disease is really essential in the in the long run and and then in the short run uh, just being conscious of political cycles and and uh, immediate needs there there are ways to cascade the care of of NCDs um, that uh, doesn't have to be done in the most specialized or most sophisticated uh, facilities. A lot can be done by nurses in primary care to outreach to communities, etc. And so there's ways about thinking around how you deliver where you can guarantee quality of care uh, while also being cost effective. And Katie, what is your <laughs> big question? What's your hope then for <laughs> for next year's high level meeting? You mentioned that this is just you know the the fourth I think you said that we've had. How can commitments and um, you know declarations made in 2025 make a really sort of tangible difference to patients' lives in the short term? You know, uh, rather than waiting to for another 10 years. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of skeptics in the room that think that, you know, high level meetings at the UN are just these massive talking shops that don't result in anything. And I, I can understand that. But on the other side, you know, I, I think what we've learned over the years is that high level meetings offer a really in, interesting opportunity for advocacy because the process in a way is, is as important as the outcome. High level meetings basically put CKD and NCDs in the spotlight for a period of 18 months to even two years in this case. And what that means for advocates on the ground at the national level as well as at the global level is that every single government around the world in the lead up to this time next year will be talking about our issue. They'll be talking about what they have implemented in terms of, going to Jose's point, their national plans, what policies they've put in place, what progress they've made, where are the major gaps and the challenges, what are the real success stories that they want to really showcase at the UN and to the rest of the world. And that gives us as advocates a real opportunity because you know putting our issue on the spotlight is, is fantastic. Um, but we also need to make sure that the high level meeting it doesn't just end up it with a you know 15 to 20 page document that is blah 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 which is sometimes what happens with these high level meetings we need to make it as concrete and as specific as possible and to be honest it can be quite a concise and short document at the end of the day but with really strong commitments um, and I'd really encourage the CKD community along with obviously the broader NCD community to to be thinking very concretely about what you want to see come out of it at the end of the day it will end up being you know a short paragraph here and there through the declaration but being really clear on what those words and what those specific commitments look like as early as possible and building political champions because it's an intergovernmental process at the end of the day it's governments here in geneva and in capital that will be discussing and negotiating the the document so we need to be working in all of those different places uh, to make a difference
Uh, Jose, to you on, on Katie's point then about, you know, it could just be talking shop, hopefully it's not, but um, do you think the meeting can be used to, to effectively push for, for these updates and for policy change and, and, and bringing about real benefits for patients like Chris? Absolutely, and we, we learn a lot from the AIDS community, for example, on how they use the advocacy and they use the communities, but they use the political stage to bring this issue to the highest levels of the political agenda. And this is what we're trying to do in the high level meetings. Once it's at that level, I think it gives then a concert, uh, the opportunity for a concerted push and, and at all different parts of uh, academia, the advocates, the scientists, the pharmaceutical companies to, to, to press the issue, to um, address the solutions. But that political commitment is key to uh, driving the action. Melanie, to you with the American Heart Association, then what's, how does your advocacy work in terms of trying to impact and shape what happens next year at the, at the UN meeting? Uh, great question. And we're working with a lot of our partners um, who are championing this. And I think one of the things that I see American Heart Association doing is really that convening and collaborating piece. How can we take these tools we've developed and begin to localize them for other countries to use? Uh, because it's a global problem. So in in the the condition is integrated, but we can also find integrated solutions to work across the world. And then, Monique, um, the key investment priorities that you would say to, to 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 governments and policymakers who are perhaps in the room today as well, the key investment priorities that they should be focusing on ahead of this meeting next year. Um, Microphone. <laughs> so many priorities. Uh, you could just give me your top three. <laughs> well, I think one thing that maybe uh, we haven't talked enough about um, is the impact of, of climate change. Um, so I think that's an important one. And the other one is that um, the issue of equity, right? And so this is not the same for everybody. And so, um, so I think um, not just thinking about, of course, we need a comprehensive package of services. We need functional primary health care, high quality commodities diagnostics need to be in place. And that will be at the core of what the bank also will finance uh, with complementary national level policies that help to reduce and prevent NCDs like taxes for sweet beverages, uh, where a lot of countries have uh, had a lot of success. And so it's a combination of those things, but underneath in how we target, how we finance, how we focus, we need to make sure that we keep thinking around who is most at risk and who's most vulnerable and prioritize uh, those populations. It's been so fascinating to hear from from all of you, and I think the overriding thing is that you know we need to all work together, and we need to start talking about it now, which we're obviously doing. This is great that it's all, all the conversations are really kicking off well ahead of next year's meeting. Thank you so much, and please everyone join me in in thanking my guests to Melanie, Jose, to Monique, and to Katie as well. Thank you. Uh, we are, thank you everyone, yeah, we're swiftly moving on to our, our, our next panel. We've already looked then at the need for an integrated approach to chronic cardiorenal metabolic diseases. So let's look more specifically now at the burden of chronic kidney disease. Now I gave you a, a stat at the very beginning that 850 million people are affected worldwide by chronic kidney disease, but only 10% of those people are aware that they have it, figuring they've, I guess, probably got enough to deal with on their plates already with hypertension, with heart disease, with diabetes. So we need to take action now to elevate CKD as an urgent global health priority and put the policies in place to diagnose patients at earlier stages, ensuring that they do get the right treatment for their conditions. So my panelists for uh, this next part of the session are Dr. Navdeep Tangri, Nav is a professor of medicine with the University of Manitoba and a senior scientist at the Chronic Disease Innovation Center. Nav, you're essentially a, you're a clinician. You see patients with interconnected diseases every single day. Thank you for being with us. Uh, grab a seat. Amanda, Amanda Harvey de Hay is a patient advocate with Renalu in France. Amanda, it's lovely to have you here with us. Please do take a seat. Dr. Joaquin Banoya is the Minister of Health in Guatemala. Minister, you've allowed me to call you Joaquin. I'm very grateful. <laughs> I respond to anything, so that's fine. Um, and uh, Valerie Lakes as well is uh, the chair of the advocacy working group of the International Society of Nephrology. I'm so pleased to have um, all of you here. Nav, let me kickstart this conversation with you then. I've been all about the stats and the, and the data so far. Um, 
and everyone, I should just say, you can also scan the QR code, which is on some of the, the leaflets, I think, in front of you, and you can find out more data. Plus, there's, I think there's more at the back of the room. But now tell us, what is the data currently telling us about the trends of CKD globally? So uh, thank you, Hannah, for first pointing out the 850 million number. It seems like a staggering number, but this number is actually an undercount because the real way to diagnose chronic kidney disease, to identify its prevalence, is through the lab. And most countries don't have a sophisticated lab surveillance system where they can get lab data and collect it and look at it nationally. So first, that 850 million is an undercount. Second, we know, even counting in today's standards, that there's been a 33% rise in the prevalence of CKD from 1990 to now, and there's a 50% rise in mortality from chronic kidney disease from now till 2040. So those numbers uh, tell the story of a billion person, trillion dollar disease that affects probably one in eight and not just one in 10. I mean, that's mind boggling. Is that a, a billion dollar trillion, is, was that right? Person. Billion person, trillion dollar. My goodness me. Okay, um, uh, Minister Joaquin, if I can come to you on that. We, we've heard a little bit about the data and, and those staggering statistics. Um, we also know that Central America has a high prevalence of chronic kidney disease, of CKD. What is the burden of CKD in Guatemala and how, how are you and your government addressing that? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, unfortunately, Guatemala lacks a national uh, chronic kidney uh, disease registry, which, as you said, pretty much underestimates the real burden. However, we do know that in the last 10 years, CKD went from being the number eight uh, cause of death to being the number five cause of death in the country. That's about a 65% increase in the mortality in the country. Um, uh, more than that is that, yes, we lack the data. However, uh, we do know how much we're spending, and it's about a, a million dollars a month, which in Guatemala, it's a lot of money in a, in a healthcare system that is under already under-resourced and understaffed. Um, so it's a huge burden thus far, and it's only going to be increased as we move further into the epidemiologic transition. So tell us a little bit more about what, what policies you have in place then to try and combat this. So first of all, uh, this new government just took office. Uh, we established a national kidney health program mm -hmm. with one person, Dr. Lowe, being in charge of it to start raising awareness, first of all, within government, but also outside of the government. That implies obviously doing some screening, uh, access to kidney, uh, kidney replacement therapy, and a kidney transplant as well. However, with the screening, we need to be careful. because If you screen, you need to make sure that you will be able to provide the treatment afterwards. And that's where the primary healthcare system needs to be very strong and be well connected as a network that when you get diagnosed early in the stages of the disease, you will be able either to prevent it or provide treatment uh, timely. And that brings me on very neatly to, to Amanda and talking to you about this early diagnosis and the need for it. It makes financial sense. It makes every sense out there. But why is it that do you think that from the patient advocacy perspective that, that so many people are still being diagnosed late, sometimes too late, often too late? And what kind of challenges does that late detection and the, the, the lack of an integrated approach to care, what kind of challenges does that heap on not just the patients, but also their loved ones, the people looking after them? Thank you, Hannah. Um, you know, I think it's actually already been said several times that the major block is awareness. So a recent study in France showed nine out of 10 people are unaware of CKD. But there's another obstacle, which is disbelief. There's actually disbelief, even when people know about it, that something can be done. And that was the case until quite recently. But now these new therapies exist and that the disbelief is still there, is holding back incentives to take action. And then I would add um, that this need to have policy change and change medical practices is, of course, taking place against a backdrop of healthcare systems that are under strain. And the previous panel talked to this. So general practitioners who are on the front line, they're struggling. The resources are short, the costs are rising. But of course, that's also the point. If there was this early detection, diagnosis, prevention, those costs could come down. And today in France, kidney replacement therapy is the disease therapy per patient that costs the most. It outstrips lung cancer, it outstrips cystic fibrosis. So we add that onto testimonies such as Chris shared, and there are far too many of them in the Renalu community, 
you get the overall picture. Uh, Valerie, I'll come to you in, in just a moment, but I just want to pick up on, Amanda, what you were saying then about France, because largely in part due to the advocacy work that Dr. Grudelou and you have been doing. But talk, talk us through some of the strategies that have been adopted by the country to, to try and improve diagnosis, earlier detection and care. So France has been recommending screening for anybody over the age of 65 since 2021. And that was adjusted in 2023 to of anybody of any age who was at risk. It's a recommendation. So we also heard it in the previous panel that you know there's progress to be made. So the big news is, is the part of the French health authorities that covers the costs, because it is state covered in France, has just issued its major annual report in which for the first time, there is a substantial chapter on CKD. So in terms of raising awareness, getting it on the radar, that is a big step forward. And it gives a diagnosis that very much reflects what we've been hearing here today and its robust data use behind it. And above all, it's propositional. So it's actually proposing measures. There's a range of them, but they include, for example, talking to general practitioners, raising awareness on screening and these therapies, but then looking at the general practitioner's own practices, who is screening, who has not screened at-risk people for the last 12 years, and encouraging them to do so with a set of indicators to track progress. In terms of policy wins, it's very early days, but it is a good move forward. Well, it's, it's great to hear the progress that is being made in, in, in France, even if it is just a suggested <laughs> uh, changes at the moment. But Valerie, to you then, you know, hearing what's happening in France in terms of policy there, what is the, um, the impact, the overall impact of chronic kidney disease on countries like France around the world when it comes to your infrastructure and your, your, your economies in general? So I think the impact is quite differential because I think high income countries are paying an enormous amount of money, but they can actually somehow afford it. And they've decided to cover most, most high income countries actually cover the cost for end stage kidney disease care, dialysis, transplantation, sort of basically on an equity basis, knowing that if they didn't do that, people would actually die because that's what happens if you don't get this therapy. Many lower middle income countries and low income countries don't have that choice. They don't have the amount of money. And so some of them are trying. They're providing dialysis, for example, at a smaller dose than is rec recommended, still using enormous proportions of their budget. There was an estimate that if Ken um, Kenya Senegal and Nigeria were to actually provide dialysis for all the people who needed it, they would be using 15 to 50 percent of their budgets, which is ginormous when you think that the end stage kidney disease population is about 0.1 percent of the population, in a, uh, as opposed to chronic kidney disease, which is this, you know, around 8 to 10 percent uh, of the population. So there's an enormous cost to the health system. And kidney disease is actually the leading cause of catastrophic health expenditure. And there was a systematic review in 2016 that 180 million families are pushed into poverty by trying to pay for some sort of kidney care. And the critical thing is here, we all talk about the costs of dialysis, but there are people who cannot afford to pay these miraculous medications because these are also not covered in many systems. Unfortunately, they're extremely expensive and can cost days of wages to buy one tablet, you know, the medication for one month. So which, costs are huge. Which brings us back to the importance of earlier um, earlier diagnosis and an integrated approach to care. Now, perhaps you can just expand on what Valerie's just been saying there about the, the impact of CKD on not just on our health, but on our health systems, on our economies, on our environment. So let's uh, break that down into a few steps. I think what you've pointed out correctly and what, what we see in nearly every country is the impact not just on patients but also on families. So caregivers' lives are often devastated by, by chronic kidney disease, often in low and low middle income countries where where climate change led to meso uh, sort of uh, you know heat stress related disease and acute kidney injury, um, the person who's earning ends up getting kidney disease and that devastates the whole family. Even in Canada and the United States, often you see spouses and significant others leaving their jobs to look after their loved one who's on dialysis. So I think the impact is much broader than the patient itself. In terms of health outcomes uh, across the world, the way the way the trends are for chronic kidney disease, again, in low and low middle income countries, younger people tend to get it and they lose productive years of life. 
with the environment, there's a two, there's a bi-directional relationship truly. So changing environment and, and more heat is leading to more kidney disease, certainly right across the belt along the equator. And then at the same time, dialysis just consumes so much fresh water that every patient on dialysis is consuming on average 80 liters of fresh water just to provide a single treatment. So think of that as three days a week, that's 250 liters. Think of that as 11,000 plus you know, sort of liters a year. So, so it's really a major burden, a bi-directional burden on the environment. And that's why I think we're all kind of squarely united and focused on, on preventing end stage because no matter what your role is, whether you're a policymaker, a physician, or a patient advocate, you've seen the impact of CKD, the devastating impact from every side of the lens. Thank you so much. And uh, Amanda, you, I can absolutely see that you'd have such a compelling argument with your advocacy and um, and how you convince policymakers to actually invest at the right stage, at the earlier stages. But talk us through some of the strategies that you used uh, at Renalu in France to convince policymakers there and how perhaps some of those strategies could be copied, adapted, adopted by others in the room as well when they go forward with their advocacy. Sure, with pleasure. Um, so it's good to hear from WHO and other panelists that they want the patient voice at the table. Of course, it's essential. So the basis for our advocacy and our drives for policy change is, of course, building on testimonies such as Chris's. And then data. Data, data. We're all talking about data, but we have created our own satellite to generate patient experience data and we also conduct rigorous analysis of the kidney registries. And we do this, we build up groups of expertise. So there's the patients plus nephrologists, health economists. And together we build up these robust data-driven evidence-based cases for change that we take to health authorities. And renalu has been working this way for over 20 years. So there's a real credibility and trust that's been built up. And the last thing I'd say is that we force ourselves to be propositional. It's very easy to stay on the observational front and kidney care is complex, but we really force ourselves to break it down into bite-sized chunks and for each one, based on that patient voice and our experiences and this data, we suggest this, this and this. And uh, we're not a huge organization, but we hit above our weight in terms of advocacy and moving the needle as it shows in France. There's about 30 of us just in the Global Patient Alliance for Kidney Care. And uh, we can only encourage everybody to try this. Uh, it is having some, bearing some fruit in France. So data is key, as always. We're hearing that in every sector of life at the moment. Um, Joaquin, for you in Guatemala and with your government, how um, available, um, accessible is data to you in terms of driving how you shape policy? Um, and what would be what would be the most convincing thing for your fellow policymakers? Is it is it access to data, or is it the research that comes behind it? I mean, uh, absolutely, I'm all for evidence-based public health, no doubt about it. However, Ones have, one has to ask how much data do we need to move policy forward and to make real statements. And, so, and this is where I think advocates, patient advocates, uh, come very, very helpful and are fundamental to move the agenda forward. And there's also so different type of data. We know how governments, how much money our government is spending in chronic kidney disease. So I think, yes, we need data, but uh, we cannot wait for data to come along and say, oh, we, know, we now have enough evidence we move policy forward. I think there's certain things we can't move forward without waiting for policy. I mean, if you think about tobacco, how much we waited for the WHO to come up with a framework convention on tobacco control, and how much we were waiting for that to be adequately implemented. Imp imp implementation was briefly mentioned before. Uh, so I think we need to move that forward without waiting for the policy. But on the other hand, if I may say also, uh, a lot of it is about prevention. But what we have learned from some of the countries in uh, Central America and the equator is this, there's about a third of the CKDs that are still of unknown origin. We don't know what's causing them. We know there's a big percentage of them that are caused by uh, diabetes, hypertension, and, uh, and obesity. Yet, there's a percentage, 30% of them approximately, that we don't know what's causing it. And that should also be a matter of concern. Thank you so much. And um, now, 
I want to stay on the data for a second. How can that, the data around CKD really then drive, drive policy change like we've seen in Guatemala and elsewhere? So first, I think in, in any country where lab data is possible to be centralized, it must be centralized. I think all CKD registries, when possible, should be based on lab data rather than based on administrative or claims codes. It's just not a disease that lends itself well to, well to claim codes. Uh, third, I think we, need, we have ample data for the interventions. So in a sense, I don't think we need more data for the interventions. And I think we shouldn't shy away, uh, sort of we shouldn't get into the trap of saying that I need to see whether intervention X or intervention Y works in, in my country or in my healthcare setting, because these, these interventions that we're talking about were tested in global clinical trials, so they work. It's really a question of implementation. Um, and we're in many, many countries where even the data is there, then the next penny to drop has to be the implementation. How do you turn that data into action? And uh, Valerie, I want to come to you on that then. Turning some of it into action would be, for example, um, the WHO prioritizing CKD in its NCD framework. What are your hopes with that ahead of the WHO, the World Health Assembly, say next year? I think we are very hopeful. I think there is a tangible change now. The WHO itself is realizing kidney disease is the ninth leading global cause of death. They themselves have said that the mortality has almost doubled in the last approximately 20 years. But I think one of the critical things that we're hoping through the WHO is to integrate kidney care into existing programs so that this doesn't become an extra additional burden or an extra additional silo that governments and policy uh, and ministries are going to have to think about. But one of the critical issues is we need then, if we're going to get data, if everyone's agreeing with that, we need access to diagnostics and we need access to these essential medications. We need to think about global equity and that's something that the WHO is obviously a champion at least calling for equity, but we need equity in terms of access to basic diagnostics, basic treatment, and as we know, in certain situations, some people will end up with kidney failure, and it's not acceptable that a treatment that's totally routine and very high income settings is absolutely inaccessible to poor people in low income settings. So we are hoping really that with the if kidney disease does become recognized as a global priority, a lot of these elephants in the room will actually get onto the table and we'll be able to really start discussing these and try to find sustainable and really um, affordable solutions because it's kidney disease is definitely a costly, at any stage it's costly. Can I pick up on uh, on some of the themes you said and also on the cardiometabolic theme that came across in the previous panel? I think some of the messages need to be that if you are a country who's screening for hypertension using community workers, dip the urine for protein. If you're a country who is screening for diabetes using community workers, dip the urine for protein. If you have areas uh, where there's farm workers or, or people in a certain region who have a very high prevalence of kidney disease, where you see the cost as coming from, go to those communities and dip the urine for protein. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can very much be paired and not siloed with other cardiometabolic screening. And that's, that's why it's cardio kidney metabolic syndrome. It, it, it can be thought of as a continuum and, and integrated into things uh, much, 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 much easier than perhaps we think it can be. I mean, yeah, as you say, it seems so obvious now we're talking about it. Um, Joaquin, I want to pick up on what we were just talking about, WHO, WHA as well. Will you be pushing for a resolution at the World Health Assembly? Yeah, that's uh, for the next year's assembly, we're going to push for a CKD resolution. Uh, absolutely, we recognize that these uh, uh, resolutions are definitely no magic bullet, but it certainly sets the stage uh, for governments to have some guidelines, to know where to go next, uh, and to know that this is a real problem. It's not a silent epidemic. I mean, you see patients suffering from the disease, you see governments spending uh, a lot of money on, on the treatments, so it's not a silent epidemic. It's part of the big chronic disease umbrella. It should be included. With some of the risk factors are shared, uh, so it's just to raise awareness and for governments to take it seriously and to go to Congress and to the different levels of government with a, with, a, with a strong tool from the WHO says to saying, this is a problem we need to address. How, how important is that then to the community and for CKD going forward to know that you've got representatives like the state of Guatemala, for example, others as well, presumably, who will hopefully join you with this calling for this resolution. How important is it, Valerie, to have these sort of proponents out there? I think for the global kidney community, it would be absolutely game changing to use a, a term that was used earlier, because we really 
nothing gets done if it's not measured and if there is no official recognition they're just not resources allocated to measure a burden, for example, or measure a cost effectiveness, et cetera. So it's really, really critical. And there are many, many countries struggling. Every country is aware of this problem, but some countries just, they cannot deal with it because the budget's implications are too high. So we need to get this on the table. So we feel it would be really game changing. Um, plus kidney disease impacts outcomes of so many other diseases. Kidney disease changes mortality of people with cardiovascular disease. More people die of cardiovascular disease with kidney disease than of kidney failure. Kidney disease is a huge problem with diabetes, cancer, uh, TB, HIV, malaria, maternal health, etc. So if we can improve kidney health, there will be actually ripple benefits we feel across other uh, health disorders and we think that also again will be of a huge benefit globally and really sort of that answer I would put turn it around as a question really to everyone else on the panel then what would be your one message then to the community who are listening in this room today who are listening virtually as well what would be your message about the importance of pushing chronic kidney disease up the NCD agenda and actually recognizing it in the in the agenda and um, Nav to you first yeah my message would be screen it's easier than you think think. And if you catch the disease early, kidney failure can be entirely prevented. It, it's not even delay, it's preventable. Thank you. Screen. <laughs> the patient's voice asks people to screen. We have to avoid so many people ending up like growth. Amanda, thank you. Joaquin, to you, your message to... I have to say screen as well. <laughs> and, and follow up. Screen and treat. Screen and, screen and follow up. And Valerie, you, uh, anything else to add? Maybe screen. Access. <laughs> you have to make screening possible, so you need the tools. And you need to screen also the right populations. But I think access. I think the message is loud and clear for everyone. Can you please everyone thank me in joining these fantastic panelists for an insightful conversation to Nav, Amanda, Joaquin, and to Valerie. Thank you very much indeed. So cardio, renal and metabolic diseases are deeply interconnected, affecting millions worldwide. We know that. The scale of the problem, as we've heard from all the stats as well, is currently overlooked. Worse still, it's ignored, completely ignored. If we are to meet our SDG targets, governments must prioritize CKD alongside other chronic diseases. We need to invest in primary care. Patients need earlier diagnosis and access to the treatments that they need. And this will then help prevent complications down the line, as we heard about from Chris, for patients and then and ease the burden on our health systems as well that are under such, such incredible strain. Today's discussion provides a really powerful platform to push for strong commitments at the UN high level meeting and also updates to WHO's NCD framework as we were just hearing about. And finally, I really want to stress the importance of our collective efforts in bringing about change. It's something we heard about at the very beginning of the hour. The stakes are obviously so high, but we can make a difference in the lives of those affected by heart, kidney, and metabolic diseases. So let's keep the momentum going. We have one year to go and counting as we work to make CKD and interconnected NCDs a global health priority. My thank you to all of you for your attention and for listening in over the last hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>